first Asian superhero, Shang-Chi. Show of hands, who's who's an accountant here? There's a lot of 
of accountants. Okay. I can't make any of my accounting jokes. Congratulations. I'm really happy for all of you. No, I, I really, I do, I do genuinely feel like I hope that you're all happy. I was not. So I, I went through school four years, studied accounting, majored in finance, and, uh, and audit, and uh, wound up at Deloitte on Bay Street in Toronto, which is kind of like our um, knockoff of Wall Street. And uh, showed up to work on the first day and was like, oh my god, what have I gotten myself into? Um, I, I feel like accounting, accounting is not a great uh, career path for you if you have like even like a 10% of a creative personality. You know what I mean? Like it's not. I'm just gonna say it. I mean, I mean, literally the whole purpose of my job was to figure out what was done last year and do the exact same thing. Anybody do audit? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? You look at the prior year and you do and you don't deviate. Because God forbid you have a new idea. Um, and so that I, and I, I was like, oh my God, that's my life now. Um, and, you know, with school, you could take a bad course, you could be in a class you didn't like, four, year, four months would go by and you would get a reset, and you could go away for break and you'd come back and, uh, and it would be fine. But in life, there's no reset. I could be doing that for the rest of my life, which is really terrifying. And, um, you know, I, I just kept kind of meandering through this job, I was like your typical like dread waking up Monday morning and then would just stare at the clock until five o'clock came around and I would not stay at the office a microsecond longer than I had to. Um, and it was, it was truly because, because it wasn't my calling. And so if any of you guys, if I'm reaching any of you guys, if, I'm, if you're feeling personally attacked by what I'm saying, <laughs> I think it might be a good time to kind of thoroughly psychoanalyze what your, what your career perspectives are. Um, so, now I never had the courage to quit, by the way. I didn't know, like I said, I didn't visualize, I didn't have any idea what even that alternate future of a happy, fulfilled me even looked like. Um, I just kept doing this miserable thing for eight months until on April 12th, 2012, I was laid off. I was laid off a week before my 23rd birthday. I was the first person in my graduating class to, to lose a job. I was like the first person I knew to lose a job that soon. It was, it was really embarrassing, really embarrassing. And I remember getting called into my partner's office with like an HR lady and two security guards in the background. And, um, and they gave me 10 minutes to pack everything up, but I had to walk through my entire office and I felt the eyes of everybody because they knew what was going on. I had two security guards that were flying me. And I had to like pack up my things, little box, turn around, walk back. Again, everybody's eyes on me, and everyone's trying real hard not to notice, right? But you can tell, you can tell that they knew. Um, I came home that night pretty, pretty destroyed. Because even though, even though I didn't like this job, it was, it was all I knew. And um, I remember, I remember looking over the balcony of my apartment and, and being like, I don't know how I'm going to face my parents. I don't know if I can. I feel like I, I just let them down so, so much. Um, and I, I thought, well, I'm going to sleep on it. We'll kind of see what happens the next day. And, um, and so I did. And I woke up. And um, funny thing, actually, I, I felt better. I felt better because I didn't have to go to work. <laughs> Which sounds pretty stupid, but it's true. I, I was like, I actually had some time to think about what I wanted to do. And, you know, I kept, in my mind, I kept going back to these movies that I would watch as a kid that I loved so much. And, um, and how amazing it would be to be a part of it. So, not knowing anything about anything, okay. All I knew was that, um, you know, there's Wong Fu on, on YouTube. I didn't know how to do that because I was so far removed. But, um, you know, I loved seeing that. But I... I thought maybe I could be an extra on a movie set because Toronto didn't have a YouTube community, but it had a nice film community, movie shot there once in a while. So I went on Craigslist and I searched TV and film opportunities, which I would not recommend that you do, actually. <laughs> Especially if you're a woman. Zero out of 10 would not recommend. Um, but I did it, and 
for some reason, okay, so there was this movie called Pacific Rim that was shooting in Toronto in 2012. And if you guys remember, show of hands, you've seen Pacific Rim. So there's a scene, everybody's seen it. So there's a scene in the movie where one of the kaiju explodes and it's in Hong Kong. And of course they need to make the set look like Hong Kong, so they needed Asian extras. So there's this call for like Asian extras needed for Hollywood movie. And I was like, I don't know. And they gave me this address that I didn't recognize because it was so far out in the middle of nowhere. And I was like, okay, either I'm gonna get murdered or I'm gonna be a movie star. <laughs> so whatever, I showed up anyways because I didn't have anything better to do. And uh, it turned out that it was the soundstage for, uh, for where they were shooting the film. And um, I got to be on set with Guillermo del Toro, with, um, with Charlie Hunnam, with Idris Elba, Ron Perlman, I mean, I mean, I was like floored how many stars were there, but not only were the, you know, the lead actors uh, were the people I was paying attention to, but also just even everybody from like the grips to the people setting up the lights, people putting down marking tape, the assistant directors, I mean, everybody just felt so full of purpose and full of life, they were moving around, everybody understood the roles, were super passionate about what they were doing, I don't know if you've been in an accounting office, that's not what we look like. <laughs> So it was an infectious energy for me, and, uh, and I kind of fell in love with it. And from there, that was kind of the first time that I started to visualize where my life could be, right? I was like, maybe, just maybe, I could get paid to do this. I didn't think I, could, I would do it full time, I didn't think I would do it for the rest of my life, but I thought maybe it, I could just do this for a while until I found another job. Obviously, that, no, that, that never came about. Because a few months later, I cobbled together enough of a resume to get an agent, a tiny little agency in Toronto. Um, I started auditioning for tiny little commercials and music videos and things that would pay me like a hundred bucks. And then I auditioned for bigger things and bigger things and eventually I got a little show called Kim's Convenience. And then I mean, usually that's where I would end the story, but uh, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I've had a week, guys. Um, this isn't a this isn't a Q and A statement. <laughs> we can talk about my stock photos later. Uh, yeah, the stock photos. You're right. I did gloss through the part where I faced immense rejection because I feel like Steve, like you guys all did such a fantastic job of covering it, but I had. I had Joe jobs, I was riding the poverty line, I had to, I had to come out to my parents as an actor. <laughs> it was rough, I, said, I had to sit them down, I had to be like, mom, dad, there's something I gotta tell you. I'm not a doctor, I was never a doctor. I'm an actor, and they're like, what, is this just a phase, what did we do? Can we send you to camp to convert you back to a doctor? Um, it was a whole ordeal. Um, and then, I don't know. And then I became Shang-Chi. <laughs> the point of all this is that when I first started as an actor, I always had in my mind this thing that I wanted to do, which was to play a superhero movie. Because superhero movies were the movies that I loved when I was, when I was growing up. Superheroes are kind of like our Greek myths of the modern era, right? Like our Achilles and our Odysseus and our Ajax. We have like our Captain Americas and Iron Man. It sounds funny, but it's, it's true. And I was always super drawn to, to the Iliad and the Odyssey. And I think the closest thing to that in the modern day is like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And so I was always super passionate about that. I watched every single MCU movie. And uh, right in 2012, I literally, I was like, well, there's no Asian superheroes out there. Maybe I just gotta go digging for some. And I, and I found this one guy, Sunfire, and I wrote like an outline for like what, a move, what that movie would look like. And then in 2014, I had an opportunity to, through like a, a film collective in, in Toronto, make my own short, like produce and write my own short film, which I wrote about a Chinese superhero. So, in my mind, like I have actually been manifesting this, this future for myself uh, for a really long time, like for seven years. And yes, I got extremely lucky. I'm like, I'm 
not bullshitting you, I'm the luckiest human being on the face of the earth. I promise you. But I also, I feel like without that clear vision in my head, I, I wouldn't have stood a chance at all. And so my one thing that I would impart to you guys is, is just to hold that vision, whatever that is in your head, so close to you and so clearly. And the more specific it is, the better. And, and more important than having that, you have to give yourself the permission to have that. Because I knew that I always wanted to be an actor. And I knew that I always wanted to be involved in TV and film, but I never let myself believe it. And part of that is my Asian upbringing um, in terms of my career. Part of that is just my Asian upbringing in terms of being told you're not, you know, you shouldn't stand out. You should just put your head down. You should blend in. Basically, that you should disappear. We're done disappearing. None of these people chose to disappear. I think they all had such, I mean, they had such strong belief in what they were doing, such a strong belief that they were gonna persevere despite all the things that were in their way. I mean, imagine being Wong Fu 15 years ago. Now I'm just cutting into their talk. <laughs> talk for them. Imagine being Wong Fu 15 years ago and having no path, but deciding that they were gonna do it anyway. I mean, that's, that's the kind of energy that we need. That's, the, that's what I think we've come to call big Asian energy. <laughs> Instead of this little Asian energy, which is kind of, no offense, but what our parents were, you know, sometimes advocating for. Which we understand, you know, a lot of instability in their life. But um, that only gets us so far. And so, as you go forth into your careers, or maybe you're already in your careers, I encourage you to embody big Asian energy and stand up tall, don't be afraid to visualize what you want and give yourself the permission to go for it. That's it.